16 years ago, the body of a young Swedish woman was recovered from an Ayrshire beach. A few days later, on 7 December 2005, a local newspaper published a brief account of her death. An area of Prestwick Beach was cordoned off at the weekend after a woman's body was found washed up on the shore. It was a dog walker who discovered the 31-year-old woman's body, about 8.30am on Sunday near to Meriborough Road. A police investigation team quickly sealed off the area but there are no suspicious circumstances surrounding her death. As the post went to press the dead woman's details had not been released. In this 72-word story there were two minor inaccuracies and potentially one major one. You see, the dead woman was not 31 but 30 years old and her body was found not near Meriborough Road but near Grangemuir Road. But the most intriguing assumption in the report was that there were no suspicious circumstances in innuendo commonly used by the police to rule out foul play and suggest the probability of suicide. While the Ayrshire Post was reporting this news, a post-mortem on the body of Annie Borgeson was being conducted in the mortuary of Air Hospital. Why, on that very day, did the police confide in journalists that there were no suspicious circumstances when they were unaware of the post-mortem result? The rush to judgment, without any forensic support, became the first of many questions about Annie Borgeson's death, despite the personal intervention of the First Minister, Alex Salmond, who had a meeting with Annie's mother, a petition to the Scottish Parliament signed by 3,000 people, and a tenacious campaign by family and friends. Yet the authorities have consistently refused to reopen the case. On 27 July 2007, the then Solicitor General for Scotland, Frank Mulholland, who is now the Lord Advocate, replied to a letter from Eva Cesa of the Swedish Embassy in London. He repeated the initial police opinion, 20 months earlier, that there was no evidence of suspicious circumstances and cited the autopsy report as one of the justifications for his conclusion. There was no acknowledgement from Mr Mulholland, doubtless because he had no knowledge that the police had reached a view of the case in advance of the post-mortem. He was at pains to point out that the procurator had undertaken a full investigation, assisted by the local police, and that there were no lines of inquiry to pursue. For that reason, he had decided that the case would not be reopened, although he did add the qualification at this stage. The autopsy report noted that the body was heavily contaminated by sand and seaweed, that the lungs were congested, the air passages contained a frothy material. Conclusion. Death by drowning. No sinister significance was attached to an unexplained depression in the skin, small areas of bruising in the right temple, scratched abrasions on the left arm and two patterned roughly square contused areas on the right arm. Although there was no penetration of the skin, the police were satisfied that these minor injuries had been caused by contact with rough objects in the water. Annie's body was flown home to Sweden on the 16th of December. The family was shocked to discover areas of more extensive bruising, which had not been recorded in the post-mortem report nine days earlier, they were assured that bruising could occur between eight and ten days after death. The undertakers in Vargada, Sweden, were surprised by what they found when they opened Annie's coffin. Gunn Daneberg and Lennart Svensson discovered big bruises, on her right arm and side, about the size of a palm, as well as bruising behind her right ear. They insisted that these bruises, far beyond anything included in the autopsy report, were not the result of post-mortem lividity. The striking divergence between the undertaker's observations and the autopsy report disturbed the Borgeson family. Pieces of body tissue removed during the post-mortem were examined by the Swedish Forensic Service also known as RMV. The RMV sent bone marrow from Annie's body to a professor in Strasbourg for analysis. He found tiny diatom shells in the sample and identified him as navicular lanceolata. It was an unexpected discovery. Far from confirming that Annie had drowned, it tended to cast doubt on the result of the post-mortem. Navicular lanceolata is a freshwater rather than a seawater diatom. The family independently contacted other diatom specialists. One who checked the salinity in Prestwick Bay found only a weak influence of freshwater. The RMV sent bone marrow from Annie's body to a professor in Strasbourg for analysis. He found tiny diatom shells in the sample and identified him as navicular lanceolata. It was an unexpected discovery. Far from confirming that Annie had drowned, it tended to cast doubt on the result of the post-mortem. Navicular lanceolata is a freshwater rather than a seawater diatom. The family independently contacted other diatom specialists. One who checked the salinity in Prestwick Bay found only a weak influence of freshwater inflows and said it was more likely that navicular lanceolata had entered Annie's body through drinking tap water. To his words he said, Annie may have had it in the bone marrow long before she passed away. A second specialist corroborated this view. Although the species might be found in low numbers in a coastal environment, it would not be one of the common species living or transported there. The source of the diatoms found in the bone marrow is therefore very unlikely to have been from the sea. 
In the opinion of these marine experts, the presence of navicular lanceolata in the bone marrow had failed to establish drowning as the cause of death. They agreed that this could only be established by analysis of other organs. One of the experts offered to conduct an extended test pro bono. The Swedish authorities not only refused to permit such a test, but declined to give any explanation for this decision. Their counterparts in Scotland seem equally unwilling to contemplate any scrutiny of the autopsy findings. On the 15th of December 2005, eight days after the post-mortem, toxicologists at Glasgow University received two samples of blood and one sample of urine labelled Annie Borgeson. The toxicologists analysed the samples for alcohol and drugs. They found 19 milligrams of alcohol per 100 milliliters of blood, well under the drink driving limit. Annie had a small quantity shortly before her death, perhaps the night before. There were no drugs in her body or, at any rate, no detectable ones. Two years after her death, the Principal Procurator Fiscal Depute at Kilmarnock, Robert Bloomer, released the results of the toxicology report to the family at their request. The family had also asked for histological samples which would have enabled a deeper examination of the body tissues to be performed. Robert Bloomer felt unable to make a decision on this request and referred it to the Crown Office. On 13 December 2007, the Procurator Fiscal wrote to the family informing him, Crown Council have instructed that the samples will be retained and not destroyed but that they will not be released other than to a skilled person for a specific purpose. Inescapably, then, the authorities have body tissues which could confirm whether or not Annie Borgeson died by drowning but, for unexplained reasons, will not readily part with them. On the last day of her life, there were two attempts by Annie Borgeson to withdraw money from a cash machine in Glasgow Central Station first she requested £100, then £50. Both attempts failed because there was not enough money in her account. For a while it seemed she had been in two places at once. At 3.15pm, when she was supposedly in Central Station, she was also captured on CCTV 32 miles away, in the overhead walkway which connects the railway station at Prestwick Airport with the terminal building. The police in Annie's home country finally cleared up the confusion, the credit card company had recorded the transactions in Swedish time, an hour ahead. In the first image from the airport, Annie is wearing the dark winter jacket which was found near her body on Prestwick Beach the following morning, a red and white fleece, trousers and trainers. Her long hair is tied in a ponytail, she has a bag over her shoulder. In the second image, around 3.16, she is outside the terminal building, walking towards the car park. Annie, having entered from the walkway, used the escalator which takes passengers down into the concourse and then continued the full length of the concourse to the exit at the far end, where she left through the automatic doors into the car park. According to the CCTV timings Annie accomplished this in 55 seconds. However, eight years later, the Scottish Review Special Investigation, Dollar reconstructed a walk in Annie's footsteps from CCTV position A in the walkway to CCTV position B outside the terminal building. It took a young woman of Annie's age and fitness, with a bag over her shoulder, 1 minute 32 seconds to get from her to be unimpeded across a deserted concourse. Walking down the escalator, which would not have been Annie's normal practice, cut the journey time to 1 minute 20 seconds. Either way she could not have done it in 55 seconds unless she was running. Or, the only alternative explanation, the CCTV records in an international airport were wrong. Why was she in Prestwick? There was a flight to Gothenburg around 6.30 that evening, and another the following morning. The family assumed that she was intending to fly home. It transpired that she had an appointment in Sweden with her hairdresser, Inga Nosborn, on Monday. Yet it seems she had no pre-booked ticket for either flight. She might have been able to buy a standby ticket at the airport, for although her bank had rejected her requests for cash, she habitually kept money in her filofax. But, according to the CCTV timings, it would have been impossible for her to inquire about a standby ticket, she was not in the terminal long enough. The many effort of people of cares about the young woman. No timeline has ever been established for Annie Borgeson's last day. The gaps are yawning, the contradictions mystifying. In the absence of any CCTV until she arrived at the airport, it is far from certain how she even got to Prestwick. She lived in serviced accommodation, Linton Court Apartments, not far from Haymarket Railway Station in Edinburgh. She had her own room but shared a kitchen with a number of other tenants. One of the staff, a woman called Jane, remembered seeing Annie in Linton Court around 1.15pm on Saturday. An hour later Annie was somehow at a cash machine in Glasgow Central. These timings are not credible. They leave Annie too little time to travel the two miles from Linton Court to Haymarket Station by train from Haymarket to Glasgow Queen Street, and walk across the city centre to Central. No one knows why Annie visited the short-stay car park at Prestwick Airport.
Annie's family say they were initially informed by the police that she may have gone out to withdraw money from a cash machine. But there was no cash machine in the car park, only ticket machines. Annie's mother discovered this for herself when she visited the airport after her daughter's death. Had Annie left the terminal building for no more sinister motive than to have a breather? Or had she, as her family suspect, arranged a rendezvous in the car park with someone? A CCTV image at around 3.19 shows Annie, grim-faced, re-emerging from the car park using a different entrance nearer the escalator. Maria Jansen, her friend in Sweden, says she recognizes that look, Annie is annoyed or angry. She had been outside for three minutes. In the final CCTV images of the sequence, she is seen back in the walkway on her way out of the airport. After a two and a quarter hour journey from Edinburgh, she had been in Prestwick Airport for all of 4 minutes 41 seconds. What she did next, according to the police's version of events, was stranger still. She started walking a mile towards Prestwick, a town with which she was unfamiliar, on a pavement by a dual carriageway, in the gathering dusk of a winter afternoon. The decisive witness in the police investigation was a local man who went for a walk along the promenade at Prestwick around 4.30 on the in the company of a friend from England. They were distracted by the sight of a person on the shore at low tide. The person was a long way out, about 150 yards, they reckoned. He or she was standing motionless at the edge of the water. The friends continued their walk to the end of the prom and then turned for home. Twenty minutes had elapsed since the first sighting, yet it seemed the lone figure on the shore hadn't budged, he or she was still there, looking out to sea. There was no one else on the beach apart from a dog which had broken loose from its owner. It occurred to the local man that the person might be contemplating suicide. He mentioned this possibility to his friend, but they thought no more about it until the following morning, when they saw that the police had sealed off the area. The local man decided to tell the police what he and his friend had observed. For the police, this was the clincher, the nearest thing to a positive ID of Annie Borgeson, who had left Prestwick Airport on foot an hour and a quarter earlier, more than enough time to walk into the town and down to the beach, there to prepare mentally for taking her own life. The CCTV images from Station Road are blurrier than those from the airport. The figure identified by the police as Annie is carrying a bag or rucksack, but there the resemblance ends, the figure looks more like a tall young man. A retired detective with Lothians and Borders Police who studied these images, from the airport as well as Station Road, gave as his professional judgment that they were all of poor quality, I would question this identification, he said. I have extensive experience of examining CCTV footage and I must say honestly that the images from Station Road are rubbish. I may assume that it's Annie, what with time and travel direction, but detectives should never assume. They work with facts not assumptions. The same expert added, we know Annie ended up on the beach, but the whole story is not known. They simply don't have a full picture of what happened. They know the start, they know the end, but they don't know the middle. In my opinion they haven't achieved the mark in this case. If it was Annie in Station Road, and her family are extremely dubious that it was, it is surprising that she was not spotted by CCTV cameras at the entrance to Prestwick Town Centre a few minutes earlier. But there is a far greater puzzle. What happened to her between 4 o'clock on Saturday afternoon and the discovery of her body at 8.30 the following morning, more. Even 16 hours later, the family insists that the police made no attempt to piece together these missing hours. The Borgesons heard nothing more about an apparently promising early lead that someone resembling Annie had been seen talking to two men in the area of the beach late on Saturday afternoon. Did the police simply operate on the assumption that, shortly after 4.30pm when the lone figure was spotted on the shore, Annie walked into the water and drowned herself? It was not until 2008, three years after her death, that the family acquired first-hand knowledge which compromised this theory. There is a final mystery. Whatever happened to Annie's hair? It was her pride and joy, part of her personality as her friend Maria puts it. The only person she would trust with it was Inga Nosborn, her hairdresser back home, whom she was planning to see on Monday the 5th of December. When the body arrived in Sweden on the 16th of December, the Borgeson family were overwhelmed by their first sight of it. The waist-length hair had gone. To Guje Borgeson it looked as if it had been hacked off, leaving bunches on the scalp of between 5 cm and 16 cm. The family were horrified. They had given no consent for this to be done. The autopsy report described Annie's hair as long, but there was no indication that it was exceptionally long and no measurement of it. Long could have meant something far short of waist length. Had some of it already been cut? The funeral undertakers in London who were responsible for transporting the body back to Sweden admitted that they had cut some of Annie's hair to make it look more presentable. They said they had disposed of the hair, thrown it away. The then Minister for Health and Community Care, Andy Kerr, in a letter to Catherine Stiller, MEP, 
said the undertakers had removed between four and five centimeters of her hair. We asked a leading funeral undertaker for an opinion. This was his reply. I have never known hair to be cut. When they do a PM, they do open up the skull, but there is no need to cut hair. For international transportation, a body must be embalmed, but again there is no need to cut hair. It seems to me very unlikely, as whoever deals with the body would think that the family might want to see it and so it should be kept as intact as possible. If the people who transported the body cut, without authorization, between four and five centimeters, it follows that most of Annie's hair was removed before her body left Scotland. It wasn't done at the post-mortem. So when was it done? And by whom? No one seems to know. Or no one seems to care. Aside from the family. Annie's family have long suspected that she did not drown in Prestwick Bay, that she was murdered elsewhere and that her body was dumped on the beach. Even if this is proved to be a mistaken view, even if the strong swimmer did simply walk into the sea and drown herself, she might still have been a victim of crime. And then there is the strangest question of all. Why would someone living in Edinburgh travel all the way to Ayrshire to kill herself? 16 years later years on, and there are no answers to these questions, and the case of Annie Borgeson still remained unopened, despite the many effort of people of cares about the young woman. Thank you for watching this video, if you enjoyed it and wish to see more, click the subscribe button, alongside the notification bell to get notified each time we release a video, make sure to also like the video and comment what you think about this case, or if you have one in mind that you want us to cover, let us know in the comment down below.